Hello, everyone. Hi. Good afternoon. Thank you so much for joining us today. Welcome to Thinking Outside the Funding Box Spotlight on BC Creatives, presented by the Bell Fund at the 2022 Members Lounge. My name is Katie Elder, and I'm the Senior Manager of Programming and Membership at the Canadian Academy. Members Lounge 2022 is presented by the Canadian Media Producers Association, which represents hundreds of Canada's independent producers. They are the people who make the shows and movies that you and I love. Uh, Members Lounge 2022 is also made possible with the support of our programming partners, Directors Guild of Canada and Ontario, William F. White International, Bell Fund, Le Fond Bell, Boat Rocker, Nabet 700M Unifor, Telefilm Canada, La Banque Nationale, the Bureau du Cinéma et de la Télévision du Québec, the Independent Production Fund, Panavision, and La Sodec. If you have any questions for today's speakers, please put them in the Q&A at the bottom of your screen, and we'll save some time for those at the end of today's session. And with no further ado, I'd like to introduce our panel. Uh, first, we have Jordan Wanch. Jordan is a Vancouver-based Métis performing artist, public speaker, and emerging filmmaker. His recent credits include Sister of Sorrow, Seeking Out Stories, and the queer Indigenous horror film Terraforming. His upcoming project, Shadow of the Rue Guru, is a limited series based on traditional midshift oral stories and is set for release in spring 2022 on APTN Lumi. Welcome. Hi, Jordan. Uh, next, we have Michelle Morris. Michelle is a feature producer and CEO of Lily Pictures. After a childhood in Iran, she traveled to 50 countries and lived in China. This experience inspired her to focus on diversity and stories that need to be heard, most recently with The Beehive, Red Snow, and Good Girls Don't. In development are When I Sing, Motherhood, Over the Next Hill, and Renegade, The Emily Carr Story. Hi, Michelle. Uh, Shanna Miera is a award-winning writer who is tiptoeing into film and TV. She's a former queer film festival director and movie buyer for cable TV, the director of the Fat Acceptance documentary Well-Rounded, and the creator of Kill Killjoy Comedy. Hi, Shanna. Uh, and finally, we have Trish Dolman, who founded Screen Siren Pictures in 1997 and is a leading producer and director in Western Canada. Trish is currently executive producing the upcoming limited series feature film hybrid Bones of Crows from award winning filmmaker Marie Clements. Other recent credits include British Columbia and Untold History, nominated for five 2022 Canadian Screen Awards, French Exit and the new corporation, the unfortunately unnecessary, sorry, the unfortunately necessary sequel. And I will pass it off to our moderator for today's session, Janine Steele. Janine is an experienced producer and administrator. Currently, she's a project manager at Creative BC, overseeing the design and implementation of the $2 million domestic motion picture fund. Uh, thanks so much, everyone, for being here. Um, welcome. Thank you, Katie, and thank you to Bell and the Academy for having us. Um, I'm really grateful, as ever, to be joining you from the unceded and ancestral territories of the Musqueam, Squamish, and Tsleil-Waututh people, Coast Salish, um, living, living and loving in East Vancouver. Uh, so thank you so much for joining us, everyone, today. I'm really excited to kick off this conversation and talk a little bit about how we in BC are constantly creative, evolving, um, and thinking outside that box uh, comes with the territory of being from the left coast, I think. Uh, so I'm going to kick it off by starting with, to get to know a little bit about our panelists um, and want to focus, or rather want to ask you, what's your focus and passion? How did you end up in this space, in the broadcast and television feature film space? and maybe a little bit about your recent work. What really drives you to get up every day? Um, and I'd like to start with Michelle. <clears throat> Hello, and thank you for having me here today. Um, well, my past, of course, was something that's really inspired me All my travels that I have had um, living in Iran as a child, as, a, as it was introduced, and also in China. And so through that, my focus in my projects have primarily been on diverse projects that I found that I find particularly interesting um, and, and stories that of women and their experiences. So for more recent films that I've produced or executive produced, there are Red Snow with Marie Clemens. Um, and that was um, distributed by Vortex and then Elevation in the US and sold to CBC and APTN and, um, and Universal Home Video. 
And then there was Good Girls Don't by Anna Delara. And it was a short film that, um, that was funded by the MIMPIA Creative BC and Whistler Short Film Award and sold to you know, Reflections Canada and GEM and Air Canada and Korean Airlines, et cetera. That's been, it's been good. Recently, I'm in um, post on The Beehive with Alexandra Lescheras and it's already pre-sold to CBC, ABTN, um, as part of their new MOU, which I think uh, Trish is, is one of the first uh, projects as well, as part of the CBC APTN um, MOU. And so, and, um, and it's distributed by, by uh, Game Theory and for a theatrical release. Um, so these are kind of this, the stories, these um, diverse filmmakers and uh, that are really are important to me and that um, I'm very proud to be part of their projects. That's what gets me up in the morning, I guess. <laughs> Great, thank you, Michelle. And I might come back to that MOU between CBC and APTN and how that's uh, worked out for a few folks in the panel members. Thanks for that. Uh, next up, Jordan, I wanted to ask you the same question. What gets you up in the morning? What are you passionate about? Hey, Janine, thank you. Uh, I, I just wanna say, first off, I, I really appreciate being on this panel. And I'm honored to be around so much talent and experience. Uh, I, I also will be learning from all of you. So thank you very much. Uh, the audience out there, thanks for joining us. Tanse, Kiwa, Bishkina Kashan, Jordan Wanch. Hello, my name's Jordan Wanch. Uh, I'm Métis, a member of Métis Nation BC, and I'm based in Coast Salish Territories mm -hmm. in Vancouver. Uh, I'm an emerging filmmaker. Uh, I've been in the industry for a long time. I'm a child actor. I'm one of those. Uh, and somehow I made it to the other side of the camera. Uh, I'm. I don't know, for me, I just want to tell stories that I haven't heard or seen often enough in uh, the mainstream media, and uh, whether that's telling the stories that I'm creating or supporting my peers uh, down here in Vancouver. That's great. Well, and I'd see, so is it better on this side of the camera or the other? I'm guessing. Uh, I, I, I'm not biased to both. We're, we're all on the same. <laughs> Excellent. Well, it's great to see that transition and see how it sort of contributes across your career. Um, next up, I wanted to dive in a little bit around connections and mentorship as a way to get to most of your panel members. And so if you could share perhaps an anecdote with us, tell us about someone or something who opened a door for you early in your career um, that really kind of set you or changed or altered the path that you thought you might be on. Um, and I'd love to start with Trish. Oh, great. Yeah. Um, I mean, it's interesting, you know, I've been um, doing this for 30 years this year. I graduated 30 years ago. And then my company's been in business for 25 years, Screen Center Pictures. So there were a number of people that really helped me out early on. And it's kind of full circle, come full circle at this stage in my career where I'm putting a lot of time into mentorship and supporting other people. I think that is one thing that distinguishes us here in Vancouver is there's a lot of support in the community. And I've always believed that uh, if we have a strong industry here and a successful industry, that it really benefits us all. So at this stage in my career, I'm super happy to share the knowledge I have and, and um, the experience I have because it's, you know, producing and directing also is something you really learn on the job. So um, some of the people that helped me out early on, I remember when I moved back to Vancouver from going to university, I, I just started ringing up filmmakers and asking them, how do I break into this business? And, you know, Nettie Wild, a director, took the time to meet me for coffee. And she said, well, you've got to go to Banff, that you've got to go to Banff and meet people. And that's where you're going to start to meet people in the industry because everyone's in Toronto and, and you'll find a lot of opportunities. And to this day, I would say that is true. Um, also, uh, Maureen Levitt and Rita Shelton Deverell at Vision TV gave me my first job in television. I remember I, I had gone to Banff by then uh, once and I came back with the TV series, a doc series pitch, and they listened to me and hired me to make these uh, a short series that they aired on their daily news show. So I'm eternally grateful for them. And then Louise Clark, who at the time was working for what would become Bell Media, they'd set up a network here. Uh, and I had pitched just on a whim an idea at Banff and she came on board as the um, Canadian broadcaster. So, um, you know, it was the kindness and generosity of strangers that helped me along uh, or in those early days. So uh, I'm trying to do that myself. 
That's great. Thank you. I really appreciate that. And I think, you know, that error, that error of support and helping people at different stages of their career. It's so great that that's falling through and those, those doors were open for you and you're opening those doors for others. It's really inspiring to hear. Um, and I'd like to ask the uh, same question to Shauna. Hi, thanks, Janine. I, um, I'm on the other end of what Trish is talking about in terms of uh, mentorship. I'm receiving a lot of it, so much help. Um, my history is in community cultural development, so I've done a lot of work within the arts trying to bring people together um, from festivals and um, sort of community center work. And then I leveraged that into working at OTV for a short time as a movies buyer. And it was the relationships along the way that have made my film projects uh, possible. So after working at OTV, they took my pitch to make a film and that uh, that really worked well for me. I didn't go to film school. Um, I didn't go into debt to make my first project and it um, premiered internationally at the British Film Institute. It premiered in Canada at Inside Out. So it did really well for me. And then what it did ultimately was open the door towards my next project, which is um, what I received the Bell Fund, uh, digital short form digital funding for. Um, and that's really where, so uh, a lot of my, my relationships helped me make the first project. And it's the mentorship is really coming in now that I'm dealing with a bigger fund, um, different, different level of um, production oversight, working with lawyers, all of that stuff. So um, I'm very lucky to have met Damon Dolivera along the way when I was working for the mm -hmm. Queer Film Festival. And he's been an incredible support and ally. Um, and I've uh, volunteered for many years for women in film. And so a lot of the relationships I've made there have helped me. And um, I think Sharon McGowan maybe spent four hours with me working on the Bell Fund um, budget. Mm -hmm. So, um, it's just been extraordinary because the learning curve, even though I've spent maybe 20 years working in the arts um, and part of my, you know, success so far in making, making these projects is that I've written maybe a hundred or 200 grant applications and become very successful on the nonprofit side. Um, but even so the leap towards um, these industry applications was quite a big one for me. So that's where the mentorship really um, was invaluable and continues to be. Everyone loves that bell budget. It's not easy for ever, anyone. <laughs> so, so and we'll, maybe we can dive deeper into that a little bit when we get into Canadian funding. Um, and I think that's interesting that you, know, that you bring that up, Shanna, the, the difference between coming from grant writing and the nonprofit arts sector versus industry um, sector. I'll be, love to dive into that a little bit in, as we move forward. So that's sort of where I wanted to turn the conversation next was around um, the Canadian funding puzzle. Obviously that's the first um, and generally starting point for many of us. How do we get our Canadian funders our Canadian broadcasters and distributors on board to sort of open up those doors and expand from there um, and then and move, move beyond that. So I wanted to hear a little bit um, just to give some clarity to our, to our group what kind of budget levels are you all working at? Um, and how, what kind of, what does that average financing plan, where do you start from when you start to put together what that budget and financing is gonna be? Um, and I'd love to start with Michelle on that. <clears throat> well, um, some of the films that I've involved with are $3 million range or right recently um, we're at $1.2 million and then all the way up to six to $7 million. So. Um, that's, and those are obviously feature films that I'm primarily focused on. And of course the short films would be more in the 75 to $100,000 range. Great. Yeah. And, and what, do you have a sort of typical list of funders that you start with in order to kind of fill that out at that, at that sort of one to 3 million budget range? Yes. Yes. Well, the list of funders is really how, what does the project lend itself to do as a feature? Primarily, you're thinking of going to um, the regional fund for telefilm. And when you're going to the regional fund right now, I think it's just south of $3 million. You don't need a distributor on board. So, and then I'd look to telefilm for about 49%, probably less. That's the maximum that they actually fund. So in terms of that whole structure, it, it would be telefilm that I'd focus on. I would look to um, potentially like a distributor anyways. Um, and if, if uh, no distributor, like if I can't get a pre-sale from a broadcaster and ideally you want a pre-sale from a broadcaster because then you can feed that more into your finance plan. And um, 
so that's you know but but if you do have a pre-sale first then distributor is less likely to come on board and provide you an mg a minimum guarantee percentage so but that would be a little bit more of the structure with the um tax credits that you would have. And then also, um, if you did get 10% of your budget, you could go to CMS and you can also get English regional production bonus. Um, so that's kind of a benefit of having uh, a pre-sale with a broadcaster first. So that's kind of the structure that you'd have. And then hopefully before you even went to Telefilm, I'd really advise you know, trying to get um, some development funds from, um, possibly BC Arts Council or, or Canada Council, or somebody just to say yes to you uh, first, mm -hmm. because that always helps in your application, for sure. Yeah, that, that all important, yeah, that early adopter, that early investor that starts to open the doors everywhere else. Yes, yes. for sure. Great, um, same question to you, Trish. How, what sort of budget range, ranges are you working at right now and, and how do you kind of start to put that puzzle together? Oh, you're muted. I hate that. Um, so generally, you know, we do both documentary and scripted, both mm -hmm. in the feature space and in the television series space. So there's quite a range of budgets. Um, you know, early on in my career, you know, I could, I worked on a lot of lower budget docs. And then at one point, docs are just so labor intensive and take many years, no matter if they're low budget or bigger budget that I just stopped doing lower budget docs. So our documentaries range really sort of starting at around a million, 1.2 million in, to feature and can be as high as two or more. Um, and then on the scripted side, sort of the lowest budget features we're doing now are five um, and northward of 15 to 20, 20 million uh, dollar projects. Now, uh, the way we do that a lot is by doing international treaty co-productions and interprovincial co-productions. So mm -hmm. we do a lot of those, um, but we also do CanCon only. But the, the, the co-productions allow you to gain, obviously, funding that you don't necessarily have access to and open up, especially on the scripted side, for marquee cast from around the world or key creatives. So that just allows you to have a larger budget. And on the feature doc side, I'm not gonna talk so much about feature films uh, because Michelle's already sort of dove into it, but you, know, you sort of cap out at a certain amount. And then if you bring in the UK, France, you know, South Africa, Australia, someone as a partner, Germany, then you get that extra chunk of funding that really gets you into the quality space because that, is our focus uh, is really on high quality. And that's what gets me up in the morning really is the chance to uh, make something really high quality with storytellers I really believe in. So, um, you know, I think here in BC, uh, the, I, you know, on the TV side and every other side, the EPRB is really important, the regional fund, um, especially with some broadcasters in the doc space not putting in CMF. I would say, you know, development is really important. So the CMF pre-development fund, the Bell Fund's really important. You know, what Creative BC's got going on is really important for development. Um, we also work a lot uh, with non-traditional funders, um, private equity, uh, US equity, gap lenders, um, and also go a lot, you know, we, before COVID, travel a lot to markets and festivals uh, to find partners and go to Los Angeles a lot for additional financing. So, yeah. Those cup, those, those cup of coffees, uh, just the cost of a plane ticket, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> Excellent. And just, uh, and, and it's, so I think that's great, you know, focusing on, you know, partnerships and collaborations and co-productions, co whether they're interprovincial or international, I think that's a really interesting place to start. The more you can bring those partners on board, uh, the more opportunities and doors that start to open for you. Um, Next, I wanted to sort of talk about applying to Canadian funders. So we've talked a little bit about Telefilm. We've talked a little bit about um, the CMF and, and Bell has come up quite a few times. Um, and maybe Jordan, you can kick us off with um, 
either the top three things you might keep in mind to make your application stand out or, or the top three things you might avoid. You can kind of choose which either side of the coin you want to focus on. Uh, I would say just for, you know, when you're putting your project out there and trying to get people interested in it, uh, don't, uh, don't write for the fun, write for the idea. At least that's what's worked for me. And that's going to be different for everybody. Mm -hmm. um, I've, I've had the opportunity to adjudicate some applications through the last couple of years as well of other people's and a clear voice uh, when presenting your idea as well. If it's confusing for those who are reading your application, it's going to be hard to fund that. So. Yes, absolutely. And that it's at the end of, you know, I think I've said a few times to folks, it's you're telling us your story and who you are through your grant application. And so having that strong point of view come through, I think is an excellent piece of advice to take away. Um, Shanna, I have the same question for you. What would you, what do you think makes applications stand out or with your hundred plus grant applications? <laughs> yeah, diff different levels. I'll tell you what I know from, you know, the, the majority of the applications. I'm still new to this side of things, but I echo a lot of what Jordan has to say. Um, my advice is always imagine that someone's at the other end reading what you're writing. So especially when you're applying to the councils, which might be more um, applicable to any emerging folks in the audience. It's, um, they're, they're much more welcoming. Early applications are much easier if you're going through, you know, BC Arts, if you're in Canada, or BC, or if you're Canada Council eligible. Um, it's, you know, you don't have to write in art speak. Um, it doesn't have to be, you know, ivory tower kind of language, being really clear, being really genuine. Um, sometimes you don't have to use the maximum word limit. Uh, if you've said what you need to say, um, pithily. <laughs> um, yeah, and with the other applications, I mean, with our Bell Fund application, I chose to use color, I chose to be, I chose to write in the tone of the production. It's a, it's a comedy showcase, what we're doing, not a showcase, but we're profiling comedians. So we got to be pretty irreverent and funny. I said we were queering and fattening comedy, um, <laughs> diasporic you know, I was kind of using the language that I would use, you know, with people in real time. Um, and I think that helped us kind of, um, kind of stand out you know when I'm talking with the insurance company I just use a really boring language it's a profile about comedians that's not really exciting but so I think using using um you know active language is helpful in the applications and uh you know my my background is as a writer I think that's why I've been successful with these kinds of applications because um for people um, who are emerging, who don't have that benefit of relationships or a really strong track record, you really do come across through your words on the page. So um, keep it keep it simple and keep it um, genuine to the project. That's great. Authenticity. So, you know, there's such limited dollars, so important. That's, you know, rises to the top, I think, with panel members often. Um, all right, so continuing to continue to start talking about Canadian funding, Canadian broadcasters more specifically. Um, let's talk about how and where you meet them. I mean, I think we've talked a little bit about market attendance um, and LA, Toronto, um, but what is your, how do you approach them and how do you get that second meeting? Because I think there's a lot of potential opportunities to have an initial meeting, but how do you get the second meeting? Um, I'd love to start with Michelle on that. Well, first of all, markets are a fantastic place. So right now we have easy access to the Whistler Film Festival. And I find that um, that's a market and broadcasters from across the country do attend that market. Some of the smaller festivals across the country, broadcasters do attend. So, um, and some of those would be even the Finn market in Halifax. But for us, it's really Whistler and we should make sure we all head over to Whistler um, late November, early December to make sure we have those meetings and get in front of people. Um, the Banff World Media Festival is another one that I find they do matching. They, they prepare, um, you know, they set up pitching sessions so you can actually find broadcasters to pitch to and start beginning that relationship. Primetime does the same thing. So CMPA hosts primetime um, in Ottawa. And so, of course, they've been online recently. They did the same thing of, of matching um, and, and you know, having opportunities to pitch. Um, I would also say applying to like FARC program that BAMP is, is created or diversity of voices. That's a good place for just getting out and, and having um, already having the leverage of the organization behind you and having them introduce you to people. Um, 
and any of the speakers that come to speak are also good at connecting people. So that's a good place. Um, you know, the CMPA has been hosting the Canada UK Audiovisual Days and the German Canada uh, Audiovisual Days, and even Ukraine. Sadly, uh, last fall they had um, they had a connection there. So meeting with other um, producers, I have found, and and this is on the funding front for me. The Canada UK was a really fantastic program that I had UK funders coming in with equity um, for because I, I've just met them. But now that they're here, they're in the UK and they're um, investing in my project, I know they have the outreach to the broadcast. And, and that helps me make those connections through them. And I guess lastly, I was thinking about um, Matthew Oppenheimer. He also, he's the um, trade commissioner at the consulate in LA. Oh, shoot, Michelle. I don't know if she's only paused on my screen, but it seems we've- Yeah, no, she just connected. cut out. Yeah. Oh, and it's such a great nugget of Intel advice. Well, I can jump in on Matthew. Oh, <laughs> she had so, some, a lot of success. Oh, so, oh there you go. go. There were, she's back. Michelle. Yes, really back. <laughs> oh, no, Matthew Oppenheimer. Yeah, it's a good segue right. into Trisha's success with that program because it is a good program, isn't it, Trish? That they're doing. Yes. Oh, okay. Yeah. Okay. Sure. What was it called? That program? Does anyone remember? Creative Content Accelerator or oh, yeah, Accelerator. So, um, I mean, the the other thing. So, Michelle's done a really great overview of the markets and festivals within Canada, and then you can and the opportunities. Of course, the broadcasters come to BC and come to speak, and it's really important if you don't know them to attend those, and they're through CMP or DOC or different organizations, and they often have meetings. But um, so yeah, Matthew Oppen Oppenheimer is a great resource. He's based in the Canadian Consul in uh, Los Angeles, and his job is to introduce Canadians and help them make connections in LA. So they've got this uh, uh, creative accelerator that I participated in uh, with Marie for Bones of Crows, and that was excellent. So really encourage everyone to apply to that program. Met a lot of people, and you know I just because I've been in the business a long time does not mean I'm not always upgrading my skills and enlisting and signing up for these programs. So um, I also did a, a television series, um, the European uh, television series special program. Uh, a, I think it was a year and a half ago. Uh, and that was really excellent because there's two focuses. There was a business focus and then there was a focus on script development and breaking down TV series scripts. So but anyhow, Matt is there not only through this creative accelerator, but if you go to LA, he can help you arrange meetings. So he's very easy to find through the Canadian Consul. Um, but, you know, it's one for me, I'm just constantly looking to learn and upgrade my skills. And that's what I love about this business is I'm never bored because I'm always learning. So um, that's super uh, important. Um, you know, before COVID, we were we were doing that eight hundred dollar cup of coffee and going to Toronto, but you've just got to find ways to meet people. And you know, someone said to me when I started, they want to know you're not going to go into real estate in six months because they're investing in a career in a person for a long time, and and you really are. There's some people that I've been working with since the very beginning of my career and continue to do so. And you know, delivering on the promise of what they get behind. So that's really important. But we're lucky here in Canada that we have a ton of programs to sign up for that you can get help, whether it's you know, going to Cannes, there's a lot of programs to support people. There's things that you can do there, like the producers network at the Cannes Film Festival where you can meet people. Um, Berlin has the Berlin Talent Campus or the co-production market. So there's just tons of ways to get out there where you don't have to do the work yourself uh, to meet people, but these programs will help introduce you uh, and help set you up for success in the international and in the Canadian market. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Filling that international gap. And I'll just do a small plug for, for those in the audience that Creative BC does have a uh, 
program called Passport to Markets, if you're not familiar with it, which can help cover some of those travel and registration costs. Um, through COVID, we were doing a virtual edition, but as the world starts to open up, as we enter an endemic period, um, we are reopening Passport to Markets to support those travel costs to get to those um, markets and events. So definitely encourage folks to look at it um, to help offset some of those costs. Um, I want to move on just quick, briefly to talk about maybe some non-traditional sources of funding. Um, there's often a gap I find that exists when we look at some of the more traditional broadcasters, funders, um, tax credits, and there's always a little bit that never quite kind of meets the, the, the budget that you need for your project. How do you, are there non-traditional sources that you would, um, that you've found success with or that you would suggest people look into that help kind of close that gap? And uh, Jordan, I wanted to start with you if you've got any advice on that one. Great, I mean, from our emerging filmmakers out there who are uh, attending this uh, panel, uh, of course, a lot of people have had success with crowdfunding. Uh, I haven't used it myself, but I've, I've had a lot of peers, uh, you know, it's been what, what's kicked off their production. So there's no shame in that when you're starting out. Uh, I've also heard lots about in angel investors. I had never met any, but if you're out there, I'd love to meet you. I'll pay for that $800 <laughs> coffee. Let's do this. Excellent. Yes, we'll make sure that, yeah, they need to find you, find you on LinkedIn, right? <laughs> Connect. That's great, Jordan. Um, and Michelle, do you have any insights maybe into that, uh, to that area, that sort of non-traditional funding? Yeah, well, you know, as I just mentioned, that private investment that that came through the um, UK Canada uh, audiovisual days was was lovely. But also in short films, I find sponsorships are fantastic. I've had sponsorships for um, dry cleaning, for house cleaning, for internet service, um, and you come along with a with a benefits package basically and say, "Hey, um, we can do all of these things for you," which was primarily credits and such, but. <laughs> It's, um, it has been quite, uh, quite successful for that. Um, I also wanted to note that CBC, Gail Young at CBC, she has a fantastic list that she puts out perhaps on her own accord and it's every hundred days and it's a list of all funding in, in Canada nationally. And uh, I'll put her email address, she said I could put her email address in the chat. Um, so you can reach out to her and subscribe to that. It just came out um, just yesterday, um, being 100 days since the last one. Uh, so that would be a good source just to just to review, and even if there's programs that you're not familiar with. Um, but I think I think it's just you know closing the gap is is really paying attention to the industry news, you know, subscribing to playback and just keeping up with what is happening and. And really, we all bless uh, Creative BC for the Domestic Motion Picture Fund and all must, as you said, labor or lobby sorry, the, uh, our MLAs for ensuring that we have another onslaught of funding um, and continues to grow, right? Yes. That's that will fill our gaps. At least twice as big to any lobbyists in the group yes. <laughs> because there's lots of wonderful projects that we're having to turn down through that program and, and yes. it's my heart a little bit every time. Um, thank you, Michelle. Uh, and so just sort of along that gap, along that line, um, let's talk a little bit about, you know, when these funding applications, because they're often oversubscribed um, or a funder perhaps falls through in some in some capacity, how do you pivot when you're sort of fairly late in the game and you need to kind of um, you need to kind of move on and keep keep things going? Um, do you have an example, uh, Shana, of an opportunity where you pivot? If you don't want to answer, that's okay. <laughs> well, I'm that. laughing because you know, not really, but uh, you know, recently with the um, Bell uh, short form application, a um, a source that had committed. Uh, nominally had to reduce their commitment. Mm -hmm. And so, um, yeah, I pivoted by increasing the producer investment. So, you know, <laughs> my, my, my take on all of this for all of you emerging folks out there is that there tacitly is quite a, um, a high expectation that you will have access to producer investment, which is, which means you have your own money somehow to spend, to float you between projects, um, through the application, the hopeful days until maybe your application is accepted. If your application is accepted, you're expected to buy insurance before you even sign the contract. Um, there's all sorts of ways in which you actually have to be kind of nimble financially. And I'm learning this myself. Um, 
it's all a little bit unexpected to me. And I think these are ways where the industry could change a bit, especially um, in the days now where we're trying to be more attendant and um, really trying to create an equ equity seeking kind of uh, ladder to, to equalize the industry. Um, but um, yeah, it, at my level, that's where it came in. I didn't have another source to be um, to bring on uh, last minute. That, yes, that elusive producer <laughs> investment. I mean, I, one thing maybe I'll throw out um, is, you know, again, coming back to tax credits and, and you know, that was traditionally meant to be sort of a reimburse. It's, it's meant to be um, something that was meant to support company growth. And then, you know, everyone got really excited, all of this funding available to kind of put into um, budgets, which then forced producers to interim and gap finance until they could receive those tax credits. So, you know, another avenue is look at ways in which you don't have to put all of your tax credits into the funding of your project. If that's ever an opportunity, that's one way in which you can kind of have that pocket of producer investment available to you on future projects. Um, I'm going to move on really quickly, uh, talk a little bit. We've talked about Canadian broadcasters, Canadian funding. Um, obviously, we're seeing, you know, where audiences increasingly are is online through streamers um, and other sort of non-traditional broadcasters. Um, and want to hear uh, from the group if your experience in approaching, that's an, a, sort of an elusive meeting where there's lots of potential, we know the audiences are there, but how do we as content creators find them in Canada, approach them and work with them? And I'm wondering if Trish, you can talk a little bit about that. Can you share sort of how you've opened that door? Sure. Um, I think, you know, what really sets us part apart as uh, producers in British Columbia is that we're on the West Coast. And so, we're not at the center of Canada where a lot of the decisions are. So, you know, I think I am my producing partner, Christine Habler, we've all, always felt like sort of outsiders. One, because we're not in central Canada, we're women. There's definitely rooms that we don't get invited to, you know, in the course of my lifetime, I've seen them. Um, so you have to be more innovative. You have to be more entrepreneurial. And a lot of that has to do with, I think, connections and making connections to Los Angeles. You know, it's a short flight. Um, so over the years, we put in time to develop relationships with the agencies. So what, that's one way to get into the streamers is if you're making factual content is you can develop, you know, show, uh, develop a relationship with an agency who believes in your work and sees the quality and potential, and then they can take it for you. Um, of course, that's generally for a fee. It's usually 10% of the sale and they'll do that. Um, we also just invested the time in um, uh, making those relationships ourselves. So there's actually a lot of Canadians in Los Angeles, over a million, and a lot of them you can meet uh, through Matthew Oppenheimer, who we mentioned. The Canadian consulate in LA used to have a list of Canadians living in LA, which was super useful. But in fact, at Netflix, there's a lot of Canadians working there. Um, you know, former uh, residents of Canada who, who've moved to LA who are working in any, everything from business affairs to scripted decision-making to movies, et cetera. So it's important to find out who those are and the Canadian support system is a real thing. So I feel like we have, you know, quite good relationships at Netflix. And then through those people, we're able to meet other people in the different departments, whether it's factual or documentary or scripted. So that I think, uh, you know, I would say we have the most footprint with Netflix. Then in, in, in other areas, when I don't have a connection, I usually go through an international sales agent or distributor. So I'm working with Beyond um, uh, Rights and Distribution on a lot of our factual and documentary content. So they're not only selling a lot of our factual and documentary, but they're also pre-selling for me. So they've gotten a project I'm developing right now in front of Disney Plus. Haven't closed that deal, but that it is, is you know an area where I didn't personally have that contact. So then I then I chose to engage someone else uh, who we work with and I trust to to take the project out. So those are a couple of different ways, you know. Um, and I've done the same when I needed to you know, meet someone at Hulu or, so um, I think those are just the variety of ways you can reach the streamers. And, you know, same with the private equity piece. I see there's some questions in the chat about how to get access to it. And it's generally, 
through contacts. So the, mm -hmm. the, the, the real advantage we have here in Canada is that you can get an anchor broadcaster or an anchor distributor and get Canadian funding and then take that to the international marketplace because Americans don't have that. You know, most independent film is entirely funded privately um, or you have to make a studio film. So there's not a lot in between. And we have this big advantage that if you have in TV, a Canadian broadcast license, that allows you to go out to the international marketplace that, 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 tells the international marketplace that you it, the project is of enough quality that you have that license and we've had now we're in this gray era where canadian tv is having huge success on these streamers so many cbc shows are on netflix and doing extraordinarily well so that says a lot to the international marketplace once you have that canadian funding in place so that can really open the doors at these markets and festivals we've been talking about once you have that Canadian um, funding in place. So, yeah. So we need like a secret Canadian like hand signal or something when we're at these international markets to indicate, yes, I'm Canadian. You know, used to be backpackers with the flag on their back on their backpack. Um, we need the, the equivalent, uh, perhaps it's small Canadian uh, pins on our on our lapels while we're at these international markets so we can find each other um, to find that underground Canadian support system. I love it. Um, so we're almost uh, to the time, I think we're going to switch to some audience questions. So I just wanted to give an opportunity, any final advice um, from the panel um, on, that you want to leave with the audience today? Uh, and Jordan, I'll start with you. Hey, right on. Uh, I think the biggest thing that, that we, we come from this panel here is that especially if you're starting out or trying to get your project out there, it, it's, it's who you know, and the best way is building that community. So get out there and meet people and, uh, and create those good relationships. Mm -hmm. Excellent. And Shanna, what would be your, your piece of advice? What makes us stand out here in BC? Yeah, I'd, I'd echo that. Um, getting involved with some associations, if you can, even your local, you know, indie filmmakers group on Facebook or something has been helpful for me for crewing up. Um, and then uh, in every situation where you can just kind of don't don't be an asshole when you meet people <laughs> like if you can form genuine connections and um, really strike up a friendship and be curious that for me has has really been helpful. Excellent, excellent advice. Michelle, what would be your your parting words. I, I think those are two very smart, smart points you've both made, um, but also you know getting out into the industry like actually making those trips. To, to Toronto or to the other festivals and markets across the country. But also when applying, don't jump into your, um, getting in your application too early. Make sure you have your strategy in place. Make sure you have the strong team around you. And then, um, and make sure you have good visuals with your projects, because that's really going to make your project successful in that competition. The competition is pretty heavy, especially for the Creative BC side of of applications. So you want to make sure that you're very competitive. Um, making sure you're not jumping in too soon is, is uh, a good step. Excellent. Thank you. And Trish. Well, I think these guys have made a lot of great points. I, I would add to that, that, you know, it all really comes down to the script or the idea. So you have to have an excellent script mm -hmm. or, and in BC, we have a lot of great writers. There's a lot of great IP here to option people to work with. There's great stories to be told from here, but that's what it ultimately comes down to. You can have all the fancy packaging and everything you want, but it has to be a really well-developed script that's ready to go into the marketplace. So get people to read it, get people to tell you what they think, get people uh, to, you know, in the industry to take a look and, and take their uh, feedback honestly um, and, and, and seriously, you know, whether it's a project that's ready to go out because you only really have one shot at getting people to read it, you know, and um, we're all over eager to just get things out there and uh, it is, you know, intensely competitive. So I think it comes down to that. Yeah. Thank you, Trish. So moving right along to uh, the Q&A portion of our session, we have a question from the audience, um, which is around pre-sales. And do you feel you need a star attached uh, or do you need a star attached <clears throat> to act to really leverage pre-sales? And I think, I think it was Trish that initially brought up pre-sales. So I'll throw the question to her. 
Well, it depends what you're talking about. So if you're talking about a feature film, um, TV pre-sales can be very helpful. So we've got CBC Films, who now Gosha Kamela is, uh, who was formerly at Bell, is now in charge of CBC Films. And you don't have to have stars attached. And you know, I think they're uh, looking at a range of feature films from uh, emerging talent to more senior talent to support the films. So the bigger the budget, generally, of course, you need stars attached, but a lower budget film uh, that accesses, you know, uh, either the Telefilm Regional Fund or the First Time Fund and ac accesses the council funding that people have mentioned, then you can have a lower budget and you don't have to have stars attached. But the, the, so in that case, the focus really needs to be on making that film your calling card and really focusing on how well developed is the script? Is the script in excellent shape? Is it interesting, innovative? Are the characters well developed? Is it a story you want to see? Would you, you know, who would want to watch it? And to think about your audience as well. Um, and then really the focus on that lower budget is making it the best quality you can make it and make it the best storytelling you can make it. So I don't think stars are necessary. So when we get into doing these bigger co-productions, absolutely stars are necessary. So we did a Canada Ireland co-production called French Exit. And what got it made was that Michelle Pfeiffer was attached to play the lead. There's just no doubt about that. And we were able to get that made by pre-selling it in Canada, but also pre-selling it in the US to Sony Classics and to Sony Worldwide. Um, and that's pretty rare to pre-sell that, but it was very much based on the talent attached because we also had Lucas Hedges. So, um, but we also, you know, when we do international pre-sales, sometimes then we'll also turn them into co-production. So. I had this feature doc and I couldn't quite raise the money I needed. I needed a few hundred thousand more dollars. So I was at IDFA in Amsterdam. I spoke to Arte. There was initial interest from Mark Ed Edwards there, who's like this documentary gatekeeper. And then I approached Sally Blake uh, in France, who's a Canadian producer who lives in France and works in France, very successful documentary producer. And then she's the one who really took it up the chain and, and brought that Arte sale home. So I hope that's helpful. Thank you. Yes, I think that's great. Um, next question we have is uh, around broadcasters and, in, and working with, uh, with an indie film um, and whether broadcasters are a relevant funding avenue for indie features. Um, Jordan, do you have any thoughts or insights into this one? I am not working on a feature right now, but I, I have been working on a, a, a short with uh, APTN, a limited series, uh, and uh, it's 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 valid. They've been they've been great to work with. Uh, I love you, APTN, if you're listening out there. Uh, uh, yeah, I highly recommend fostering those relationships if, if you can. Okay, excellent. Well, then I'll pass the question on to Michelle, um, because I know you mentioned Beehive, which I believe has uh, CBC and APTN involved. Yes. In. I, I would count it in sort of more of the indie features category. Um, I guess it depends on the budget we're talking about. Oh, for but sure. Yeah, because it's a, it's about a $1.2 million um, feature. So it 1.1 maybe. Um, so yes, we had gone to CBC and APTN and had um, conver simultaneous conversations with both at the same time. And it just so, and that was last year. So it just so happened that they were already thinking about their MOU that they were going to form between, between their, their two entities. And um, so they can help promote the productions between the, between the two. And so they, yeah, so that we were one of the first to be part of this MOU and they were still sort of working that out um, between the two of them. But um, with that, they, we didn't have any star cast attached. In fact, we were non-union. And it was something that Crave was hesitant to be involved with, um, sort of a non-union actors um, cast. So um, they passed and, and CBC and APTN were indeed still interested, um, which, was, which was lovely. And um, yeah, I think that's. Excellent. Well, and it, it's and yeah, it's great to see it's you know coming coming to theaters and screens near us very soon. Yes, so yes. Thanks to broadcasters. But you know what's lovely yeah. about those broadcasters is they're also allowing, even though it's a pre-sale and they fed into the finance plan, they're also allowing um, a, a festival release and a theatrical release. Mm -hmm. So they're allowing that pocket of time and even um, 
we are going to have even a VOD sale prior to uh, CBC, GEM, Lumi, BTN. Yeah, so that's it's all working out. So flexibility in this new era of multi multi screens and multi multi. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, our next question is around finding that sort of you know really important first key primary broadcaster that anchor or sorry distributor I should say anchor distributor in Canada is the question. How do you get them? How do you get that anchor distributor? Um, and I'm going to ask Shanna, do you have experience in this area? you want to speak to not yet i was no I work, I work, i'm working with more. um cfmtc so for exactly. super emerging folks they're um they're the indie art focused distributor out of toronto but well that's i mean i think that's industry. an interesting yeah. place to start right some of the i think that's it's often a bit nebulous um what and how distributors work in canada so knowing some of those niche genre um, really focused distributors is probably a good place to start for, for merging and, and yeah they focus mainly on festivals so um, so they do all of the work for you and for emerging filmmakers who are out there who are spending an arm and a leg on submission fees to festivals if we're talking at that level um, if you get yourself a distributor like CFMDC they will do that for you and you won't have to pay that money out of pocket. So that's why they've been really helpful for me. But my project uh, originated with a broadcaster, so um, the only relevant uh, distributor for me uh, at the, for that stage was CFMDC. CM and someone's just asked to repeat that. CMFDC is that right? Canadian Filmmakers Distribution Center. Excellent. There's also Vivo in Vancouver. Yes, long-standing supporter of the arts. Excellent. Um, I'd like to give a shout out, um, Janine, to um, Game Theory, because they actually have a bit of a breaking barriers program mm -hmm. where, you know, for, for diverse filmmakers and you, they have a program set up. So I suggest checking that out online um, and seeing when the next application round is, because they will distribute, provide a theatrical, provide sponsorships in terms of visual effects and equipment from William F. White. So they have a, a program set up for distribution. Okay. Yeah, I can also jump in a little bit more on other distributors. So, you know, for a long time, we sort of had a juggernaut of a few bigger distributors. And since E1 has sort of uh, exited the picture uh, uh, supporting Canadian films, that sort of opened up the marketplace that I've been able to see. So, you know, Elevation is sort of a, a bigger uh, company. They're also mm -hmm. now into producing. We work a lot with Photon, uh, which is being managed mm -hmm. by Mark Sloan, who was formerly at E1. Um, MK2 is now in the Canadian uh, marketplace. Stephanie Azam is there, who was formerly at Telefilm. They're looking for Canadian feature films. You've got Level with John Bame. We can go to Game Theory. I mean, there's quite a few. Uh, and so if you're making feature films, you want to meet all these people. And the best place to meet them is at festivals. So if you're based here in BC, as Michelle mentioned, Whistler is really important. Attending TIFF is really important. If you're doing docs, going to hot docs. So at hot docs, all of the sales agents who distribute docs are from around the world. So even recently in the last few years, I was looking for new doc distribution. So I just arranged meetings with all of the doc distributors and just looked at what they were doing and sort of uh, during COVID did that as well, did sort of a survey, like who's doing what, what are they selling, what, what, what feels like their sweet spot. So you can, you know, when you attend these festivals, just reach out to all of the distributors to meet them. Um, Show Canada is also another thing that maybe people don't know about. Show Canada is where distributors meet with the exhibitors and present their upcoming films. I know it's happening again this year. So you can attend that as a producer and all of the distributors and exhibitors will be there. And if you're working in the feature film state space, it's really important to understand the exhibition side too and develop those relationships because of promotion. Mm -hmm. uh, and because you can also self-distribute sometimes, which we've done as well. Um, then we've got one more question, I think, that we have time for, and it is also directed to you, Trish. Um, and they're asking, can you tell us a little bit more about the best ways to pursue private equity investment in either film or television? How have you kind of... I wish there was... Without, like without opening your Rolodex and showing the screen. <laughs> I wish there was like a magic bullet because there's not, it's not like, you know, I didn't start out in this industry with like a rich uncle or someone. I, I just started out with a one room office that I sublet from another company. And 
I worked, you know, did these gigs for TV while I developed my own material. I didn't, I didn't have a Rolodex of millionaires I could just call up, you know, so it didn't work that way, but really it came out on the strength of the project. So most often private equity is the last piece, right? So people will, if you're looking for money, you need to put the word out. So the great thing about Canada is you can raise a big chunk of that funding. So if you're doing features, get telephone, get a distributor, get your tax credits sorted and figured out. Um, you know, if you're doing docs, there's a lot of documentary funding in this country to apply for. Apply for it all. Some, some of the funds we apply three times, get it in place. So then you're looking for it. what you can do is that last little piece. So sometimes facilities and equipment houses will become that angel investor where they'll give you those services for free in, term, in return for a credit uh, or appreciation. Um, definitely have gotten like billionaires to invest. And that just came through the strength of the piece being based on a book that someone heard about and we put the word out and we got an introduction to an introduction to an introduction. You know, it's just about getting out there and having a really strong project. So there's not, it's not like, um, you know, most of these people don't want to be even known who they are, but it usually comes through someone who, you know, so I've had Private investors invest in docs that were friends of one of the filmmakers who really believed in the material. And so they put in $100,000 or something. Uh, it's just through beating the bushes, you know, like really getting out there and, and talking to a lot of people. Excellent. Well, thank you for that. I think on that note, um, we're going to unfortunately have to wrap up. I feel like we could keep chatting, but I want to take a moment to thank each of you um, for taking the time, sharing your expertise, your love, your passions um, with the group today. I think, you know, our, as we've mentioned, entrepreneurial spirit and uh, scrappy uh, tenacity, um, authenticity, um, and and strong scripts are what's going to get us there. So I'm going to pass it back to Katie to wrap us up. And thank you everyone for joining us. Thank you. Thanks folks. Hi there. Thank you so much. I'm just gonna echo what Janine said, but I wanna thank Michelle, Shanna, Trish and Janine for, oh, and Jordan for today's conversation. Um, another thank you to our partners as well at mm -hmm. Bell Fund for presenting this session. Mm -hmm.